In fact, the, the retired deer biologist Matt Knox in Virginia was sounding the alarm much earlier than this on National Forest, and uh, he, he penned a series of articles. I think they were called Your National Wastelands. And yeah, you can look at it and say, wow, look at all these beautiful big trees, these, these hardwoods, but look at the understory, nothing, or mountain laurel and rhododendron, depending on what slopes you're on, and just little quality for wildlife, not just deer, but songbirds, small mammals, etc. And some, some species that are imperiled because of those habitats being non-existent. Sorry, can you give us some history on when this population decline was starting to get noticed? Like how long yeah. has this been going on? Yeah, Georgia DNR had great harvest data because they're they're checking hunts so folks bring their deer to a check station and so from 1979 all the way to the 20 teens so 2015 or so is when they track these populations seeing in particular a decline in the mid to late 2000s and so this decline by the way i'm going to spoiler alert it coincided with changes in, in forest harvest and so National forests are designed to provide multiple use, hunting being one of them, but also timber harvest and dirt biking, fishing, and all that. And so there have been drastic declines in timber harvest, which leads to poor habitat conditions. And, and that's what really led to this project is to understand how these habitats might be impacting deer populations. And so having these great sources of harvest data on deer it, it allowed Georgia DNR to understand that something was going on and it had been for some time. And so that harvest data on eight wildlife management areas, which comprised hundreds of thousands of acres, show that it wasn't just some anomaly, like, you know, some freak thing on one WMA. It was all of them in the Appalachian showing these declines. Okay. So the timber harvest thing is a, is a bit controversial, right? Very. Because there was a, there's a couple instances just fresh in my mind, uh, specifically up in Tennessee, that a buddy of ours was pretty involved with. I forgot the name of the WMA up there, but uh, they were talking about doing some uh, uh, like kind of prairie grassland restoration, and so they were going to cut a lot of hardwoods. And the deer hunters came out of the woodworks mad about it. I mean, like ready to fight. And it eventually was kind of shot down, and so they're not doing it. Do you remember the Bridgestone? Name? Bridgestone. Um, and uh, because there's this uh, perception of like, you know, when you cut the oak trees down, it's going to totally screw up your deer hunting. We just talked about that with Brian and all them uh, on our previous podcast that the listeners probably heard a couple weeks ago. Um, but can you talk about that a little bit where the, the timber dynamics of the national forest, like these big woods, Appalachian Mountain settings, how the the removal of, of timber harvest actually kind of screwed things up? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, these areas would have support, supported large uh, lumber mills and communities would have thrived because of that business that would have been in an area. And so we're talking about areas on, that are on U.S. Forest Service property, so national forests, but these wildlife management areas are managed by the state agency, so Georgia DNR. The U.S. Forest Service controls all of the, the timber management, but Georgia DNR can only implement hunts and they can do some food plot work, et cetera. So it lies with the U.S. Forest Service. And over time, I mean, there were some changes in demand for forest products, but also environmental rights groups, including Forest Watch in North Georgia, they have come in and every time the U.S. Forest Service posts for public comment that they're going to do some habitat management and timber harvest, Forest Watch and other environmental rights groups protest it and they get legal with it through the Southern Environmental Law Center. And so they've got a big lobbyist organization. They've got a legal component and they challenge these timber harvests and they've essentially shut down logging in these areas. And for most listeners that are hunters, we understand that timber harvest can improve habitat. I mean, we all love to find great bedding areas and, and forage areas that are created through clear cuts. But to a lot of people, clear cuts and timber harvest are really dirty words. And one of the strategies that this Forest Watch organization takes is they try to have many areas designated as um, old growth forest. And what we're actually looking at are forests that were harvested at some point. It could be one to two centuries ago. They're not virgin forests, but the more areas that they can be, they could find and encourage and essentially bully the Forest Service into designating as old growth, those areas will never be cut. 
And so that's one of their big strategies beyond just protesting every timber harvest. So what we see is if a timber harvest is slated to occur and it's going to be like 3,000 acres, through legal action, it'll be, it'll be winnowed down to several hundred acres. Or it'll be a you know, minor thinning or an operation where just a few select trees will be taken out. And so over time, this has eroded the ability to harvest these areas, and it's, it's eroded the economy in the area so that now mills are gone and there's not demand for forest products. So even though today the Forest Service is ramping up some harvest, particularly in the Piedmont versus in the foothills and the mountains of Georgia, they're still having trouble getting those products to mill. Some of them in, the, in pine lands, for instance, the pines are over the size that the mill can, can accept. And so we're in a really tough spot right now. So you'll, you'll see the Forest Service trying to get some habitat on the ground, and some of those trees get cut and they lay. They don't go to the mill. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. Uh, what is it about the Appalachian Mountains, and specifically North Georgia, that attracts these environmental groups that get all hot and bothered about timber cutting? Because uh, in Alabama, we have national forests, and they cut them, buddy. I mean, they cut them. And it's it, awesome. It, it warms my heart to see it cut. And, and also, <laughs> I have a pack of beagles. So to find those areas to rabbit hunt. Dude, we're going to get along just fine. Yeah. yeah. I've I'll known you, you for like 10 minutes. I already <laughs> love you. I should have brought my pup, Penny. She could have sat right here. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's heartwarming to see it cut. But unfortunately, my heart's not warm too often nowadays on public land. But um, what draws folks to the North Georgia we're, they're just north of Atlanta, so you know a huge population center, greater than 5 million people. And what's sprung up since the 1970s and, and particularly in the 80s are these resort communities in North Georgia, people that want a mountain living experience. I was just at one last week that's having some issues with overabundant deer. So here we are, overabundant deer in the mountains adjacent to national forests where we're seeing declining deer populations. Now, I won't get into all the differences there, but these communities, which have golf courses, landscaping, et cetera, they're, they're embedded in the mountains. So these contractors are able to build houses into the mountainside. And so these folks retire there from all across the country, but particularly Atlanta and, and Chattanooga, et cetera. And once they're in the mountains, they want things to do. They want to hike. They want to get involved. They want to network of people. And they have a lot of time because they're retired. And they join a group like Forest Watch, and they honestly don't know the difference between conservation and preservation and that timber harvest can be good for wildlife species. And so their involvement becomes this new passion to stop cutting a forest. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like probably well-meaning people, but just ill-informed uh, on like the implications of, of what they're advocating for right absolutely D don't tell forest watch but i'm i'm on their newsletter so i receive all the information that they're <laughs> <laughs> keep your enemies close yeah and um <laughs> it, it's great it's like come on out we're gonna hike you know such and such mountain and we're gonna learn about plants we're gonna see some old growth forest um along the way we'll pull some invasive plants you can bring a dog if it's well behaved we're gonna have lunch at the lake sounds great if i was retired yeah i get to interact with people and all that but then these people become mo mobilized and their money becomes mobilized for other purposes. And, and that leads to where we're talking about deer populations that, you know, deer can't make a living essentially and support their fawns because there's just not enough forage on the ground. Could, could you talk about some of the history of timber practices specifically in the Appalachian Mountains um, and also change of habitat in the last, I don't know how much history we have, maybe the last couple hundred years of how so much changed? Has it always been kind of like bigger timber? Was it ever like more savanna? Like what is, what's the history of it and how has that practice been, I guess, uh, cultivated, that timber been cultivated for the last hundred plus years? Sure. And well, well, we shot, we shot ourselves in the foot by over harvest. And then of course, following a lot of these large scale timber harvests, we'd see um, explosive fires, you know, whether from railroad sparks or actually being lit or charcoal production. And so extreme timber harvest on a grand scale coupled with these catastrophic fires really decreased most habitats by the turn of the, of the, of the 20th century. And so we saw deer populations that were over harvested by market hunting prior to that, and then over harvest dog hunting, which is good, but in, in the sense, it was, it was used for the market. And so what we saw was 
areas that were over harvested, they were degraded through extreme fires, and they regenerated. And then through the early you know 1900s, we had more modern forestry practices and timber extraction, both pine and hardwoods, going to the mills. And it was more responsible. I mean, reasonable size, clear cuts, etc. We wouldn't have seen a lot of savanna. We would have seen some of that more in the fit, foothills and, and in cove areas where people would have settled. Um, some of those areas would have been maintained thousands of years by, by Native Americans through prescribed fire. Prescribed fire was removed from the landscape as well, leading to trees that are, are more accepting of conditions that, uh, that, that don't have fire. And so winning out over oaks and other hardwoods that, that, um, that can live through fire. And so change through, you know, uses as well as um, reduction of habitat practices, including prescribed fire. Interesting. Okay. And then when it came, what, what was the, I guess, the peak of deer harvest in, in like that setting specifically in Georgia? Yeah, it, and you know our 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 graph isn't complete. Starting in 1979, having really good harvest data, but it would have increased in in the 80s and early 90s. And which I have to say, as a boy in Pennsylvania, that's what we saw: as deer populations were booming in the early 90s, and, and it mimicked it here. And then that decrease would have come, especially in the early 2000s, when timber harvest also dropped out. So we were able to work. Andy Little was a, a researcher we were working with when he was here at Georgia, and he worked closely with the Forest Service to obtain their harvest data. And what we saw was, and, and actual standing timber, what we saw was the, the amount of young forest went from being a really primary component of these ecosystems. So, you know, maybe even 30% young forest, indicative of forest harvest, we went from that to now a percent or less of the entire landscape of these national forests is young forest. And so very little early successional habitats, few meadow areas, little regenerating forest. Is this a common, I guess, is this a common, uh, situation in other states where the Appalachian Mountains run through, as in like lack of timber harvest and, and lowering of really deer population? Absolutely. So across the Appalachian chain, mainly being owned by the U.S. Forest Service and this reduction in, in management and timber harvest. You know, in fact, the, the retired deer biologist Matt Knox in Virginia was sounding the alarm much earlier than this on National Forest, and uh, he, he penned a series of articles, I think they were called Your National Wastelands. And yeah, you can look at it and say, wow, look at all these beautiful big trees, these, these hardwoods, but look at the understory, nothing, or mountain laurel and rhododendron, depending on what slopes you were on. And just little quality for wildlife, not just deer, but songbirds, small mammals, etc. And some some species that are imperiled because of those habitats being non-existent. Rough grouse being one of those. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we went from where you can go and have a several grouse day and many flushes to where people go to the North Georgia mountains to maybe find one grouse a season. And and I know growing up in grouse country too, it was like they'd sit on a limb next to you while you're bow hunting. Like, do I want to ruin my deer hunt and take a shot at this thing? They're so delicious though. <laughs> yeah. But they were so common. I mean, you know, yeah, it, it's that's indicative of change. And those rough grouse rely on different stages of forest growth, not just those those overstory trees, but midstory and understory for nesting, for, for getting buds off of trees, for the insects that, that help them to proliferate in population. When that's all gone, yeah, that's that's an indicator that something's different. Interesting. Hunting unicorns, those rough grouse, it's like hunting a unicorn. That's what our buddy Nick <laughs> says in East Tennessee. So, yeah, that's, uh, so, I, like, we're, you know, we're kind of talking about, you know, timber policy, a little bit of politics here, uh, and, you know, what does that have to do with your deer hunting, but... I mean, it has to do with the carrying capacity of the landscape, right? Because you're saying all these uh, young forests are gone and now it's a percentage or less. Can you talk about, I mean, just go a little bit deeper on the role that that young forest plays for whitetails, not even from a food standpoint, but also like fawn and cover, things of that nature. Right. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. So the fawns, they're, they're considered a, uh, they've got a hider strategy. So early in life, those first 30 days in particular, they need that cover to bed in. 
And what's also important regarding that cover of where Fawn's bed is that mom is in the local area trying to get enough groceries to produce enough milk. And if she can't get enough food to produce milk, she produces milk of the same quality but less volume. And so if you and your brother or sister are twins and one's a little stronger, you're going to get more milk and the other one's going to fade away. And that's literally what we see in these populations is fawns that are, you know, they're falling off due to abandonment and malnutrition. And so that cover is really important to protect those fawns from, to provide them with seclusion against predators. Because what we see in these Appalachian regions right now is that black bears are extremely successful in getting fawns, that these little protein packets that they can eat in the spring, and not to mention how well coyotes are doing. But by not having cover, it makes it just so much easier. Like if you were in a shopping spree, right, um, and you run into the grocery store and there's a bunch of hurdles, you're going to be slowed down, right, getting that whatever, maybe your brisket, right, and filling your cart with with pork loin, whatever it may be. Um, But if you're a predator and you can just course through the landscape and you're scanning, you're smelling, and all you need to do is look over these old logs and find a fawn, it's a much different story versus going through complex habitats that are taller than you and extremely dense and overlapping. I mean, it's just like run running a track race, and along the way, they get to pick up fawns. That, but also not having enough buffer pr- uh, prey species as well to kind of take some of that pressure off. Like you talk about rabbits, it's like I'm sure the rabbit population is not doing great up there. And you talk about you know food sources for coyotes and <laughs> stuff like, like that. There's like two rabbits up yeah, there. Yeah, and it's <laughs> but but we we because we've had a couple uh, habitat managers come on talking about like the importance of having buffer species, like prey species specifically for coyotes and bobcats. That hopefully kind of takes like that along with trapping and everything. They kind of take some of that pressure off the fawns, um, right, and, and so on. But it's like an environment like that. There's probably a, not a lot, not an abundance of other options for specifically talking like coyotes uh, for them to necessarily feed on. You know, yeah, yeah and, and and they're not just carnivores either. We did a diet study in South Carolina with with South Carolina DNR, and and these coyotes they're eating a lot of plant matter, you know, including soft mast. And think about bears. It's easy for a bear to sit in a stand of blackberries and, and gorge itself. It's kind of hard to go around and have to maybe chase down a fawn and, and fight off mom to a degree. Not that she's probably attacking bears, but she comes in and intimidates. And so you have these costs where um, predators are having to work a lot harder and they're more apt to find that, that protein in a fawn versus trying to eat a bunch of plant matter or the small mammals that occur in there and the bird eggs, et cetera. 